Hey friends, let's continue with my little YouTube series on Evo Devo. Last week I gave some general background and today I want to jump right into some of the literature. But first I have to present a few more general insights. The first thing I want to mention is the myth of THE scientific method. You've probably encountered this simplified version of the hypothetico-deductive method which some people treat as dogma. I'm not particularly impressed with it. In particular, some people, usually the people who do, don't do any science, treat it as the one true way to do science, which it isn't, and like to throw up diagrams like this on, on this one to lecture us on how we should be doing science and hector others for how they aren't doing true science. But also the emphasis is all wrong. Number one, first and foremost, ought to be observation. The key skill you need to be a good scientist is being able to do good, precise, reliable observations. There are plenty of papers out there that are just documenting really cool stuff that was seen. No hypothesis really required. They're good science, even if they don't fit well into this cartoon. There is one other ingredient, but it's magic. I'll tell you what it is after I introduce today's paper. So today what I want to talk about is the Heidelberg screen by Eric Wieschaus and Christiana nusslein volhard It's an amazing work. Although some of you might complain that this is supposed to be a series about Evo Devo, and this paper is actually research in developmental genetics, it hardly talks about evolution at all. Have I already drifted off topic? Now, you should be aware from last week's video that I consider discipline boundaries to be bogus already, so what do I care? Good science integrates multiple ideas. Evo Devo uses the tools of developmental genetics, so this kind of work is foundational. You need to know developmental genetics to do developmental biology and Evo Devo anymore. So let's talk about this excellent paper. It's a retrospective review written in 2016 of the work on early fly development done in the 1980s, eventually winning the Nobel Prize in 1995. This is the work that set the stage for the emergence of a set of ideas that we actually call Evo Devo now. I'll link to it down below. It's open access, but I should warn you that it's almost 50 pages long. It's good reading though, so give it a shot. The abstract says, in large-scale mutagenesis screens performed in 1979-1980 at the EMBL in Heidelberg, we isolated mutations affecting the pattern of structure of the larval cuticle in Drosophila. The 600 mutants we characterized could be assigned to 120 genes and represent the majority of such genes in the genome. These mutants subsequently provided a rich resource for understanding many fundamental developmental processes such as the transcriptional hierarchies controlling segmentation, the establishment of cell states by signaling pathways, and the differentiation of epithelial cells. Most of the Heidelberg genes are now molecularly known, and many of them are conserved in other animals, including humans. Although the screens were initially driven entirely by curiosity, the mutants now serve as models for many human diseases. In this review, we describe the rationale of the screening procedures and provide a classification of the genes on the basis of their initial phenotypes and the subsequent molecular analyses. Remember I mentioned that there was another important ingredient to the scientific method? And there it is. It's curiosity. I love that the abstract admits that the primary motivation for this work was just simple curiosity. Don't be ashamed of it because it isn't in the Popperian model for science. We do this stuff just because we want to know, and that's enough. So, what is this study? I remember when it first came out. What impressed me then was that it was a saturation mutagenesis study. They sat down and decided to do a massive genetic screen in which they treated flies with a mutagen to such a degree that they would mutate every gene that affects early development in the fly and then examined all the resultant mutants. I read about this work as a graduate student, fully aware of how much work was involved, and 
terrified that this was going to be the new level of expectation in this field. It was that impressive an accomplishment. There was a method to their madness, though. The first thing they did was pick a good subject and an interesting question to answer. And this is the experimental organism, the larval of the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. What ought to be obvious is that there's a specific pattern here. This isn't a featureless bland tube of a maggot. There are bristles and bumps organized in bands with variation from band to band. In addition, there is patterning within each band. They have a specific orientation. They also vary from ventral to dorsal. So there's a whole lot of organization here. So what they did was look for significant variations to that pattern in their mutants. They had a set of criteria to constrain their research. First, there's a set of mutants they don't want to waste time on. So they said, do not keep embryonic viable, lethal, normal looking, lethal BFP, that is brown, faint, or pigmals, pimples. Notice that the one thing they were not looking for is variations that were viable or looked normal or had minor variations. This was key. They wanted genes that had major structural effects on the construction of the organism. There is a place for studying mutations that, for instance, wreck metabolism and kill the animal. But be aware that they are looking specifically for strong mutations that disrupt morphology. They aren't going to waste time here on genes that affect pigment spots. And again, there's definitely a place for that. It's just not this study. The mutations they wanted met these criteria. They were going to keep cuticle differentiation mutants, cuticle integrity, DV, dorsal ventral pattern, anterior posterior pattern, homeotic, and other. That is, they wanted mutations that affected the shape and form of the animal. They messed up the pattern that you see in the larva. So anything that disrupted the pattern was good. Anything like a homeotic mutation that transformed one part of the pattern into a different part of the animal was golden. So, as the abstract says, they found 600 mutations that affected 120 different genes, which was great. It meant they had multiple alleles of each of these genes. If they'd only gone that far, this would have been a significant accomplishment. But the other part of their work that was just as impressive was the analysis. Once they had the genes, they could figure out the relationships between them, and they could also categorize them into groups. Genes that affected dorsal ventral polarity, for instance, or genes that regulated anterior-posterior patterning. Furthermore, they could look at relationships within an axis and get an idea of the timing of development. For example, they identified five classes of anterior-posterior genes and when they were active. There is considerable overlap in timing, though, because flies have an accelerated and compressed pattern of development. The first class are the maternal genes. These are genes that needed to be active in the mother's ovaries. The embryo doesn't need to transcribe them. So, for instance, the mother fly packs the egg with the RNA of a gene called bicoid, which specifies which end of the egg is anterior. The second class are the gap genes. If any of these are genes are knocked out, broad regions of the embryo fail to develop an appropriate pattern. They essentially dem demarcate the position of sets of bands in the embryo. The third class, and a rather surprising one, are the pair rule genes. There are genes that are expressed only in the odd-numbered segments, and others only in the even-numbered segments. These are the genes that are essential for defining individual segments of the segmented larva. Fourth are the segment polarity genes. So once you've defined a segment, these genes define what end of the segment is front and which is back. If you stain the embryo for one of the segment polarity genes, you get a beautiful pattern of horizontal stripes. One stripe for every segment. If you stain for pair rule genes, on the other hand, you get horizontal stripes, but half as many, with a stripe in every other segment. And finally, we get the selector genes, also called the Hox genes. What they do is confer a specific segmental identity on each stripe. Is it a head or a thorax or an abdomen? And further, 
which segment of each region of the animal is it. These are the genes responsible for the familiar homeotic transformations like putting a leg where an antenna should be. And this is where we start to get into the real Evo of Evo Devo. Once Nusslein Volhard and Vishal said cracked the code and identified the genes responsible for these crucial events in early fly development, other people could get in the act and, and search for those genes in other organisms, enabling evolutionary comparisons. And oh boy, did they. Once you've got the code for a pair rule gene, for instance, you could ask whether mice or nematodes or zebrafish or spiders or snakes have the same genes. And they do. Then we could go further and use these genes as probe to ask what mechanisms mice and nematodes and zebrafish and spiders and snakes use to assemble their body plans. And that's where the fun begins. There are similarities. All these organisms have some of the same pair rule genes, for instance, and there are enlightening differences. Vertebrates use the pair rule gene in segmentation, but it's expressed in every segment, not every other segment. Once you start trying to figure out how those differences evolved, then you're right there in the heart of Evo Devo. By the way, the genes that specify the heart are homologous in vertebrates and fruit flies. You see where this takes you? Suddenly you are seeing common descent made manifest, and you're also studying the differences that make descent with variation so interesting. I hope that gets you all started on some foundational science for Evo Devo. I highly recommend this Vishaus and Nusslein Volhard paper. Don't be intimidated by the length. It's not as te technical as I feared, and going through it will teach you some useful genetics. I'm planning to do a live stream to talk through it with you on Saturday at noon my time. I guess Friday was taken with some holy day or something. And besides, I'd rather take the opportunity to talk with my kids and grandkids on that day. Also, if you're really interested, an excellent on, a book on the subject came out in the very early 90s. It's called The Making of a Fly by Peter Lawrence. There was a time when I taught a course in invertebrate developmental biology. Just invertebrate work, which is kind of weird since the principles are the same across the animal kingdom. And this was the principal text. Also, every year in that class, I'd announce to my students that this work was going to win a Nobel Prize any day now, until the year they actually did win a Nobel and I could retire my gift of prophecy. So, right now, admire my list of patrons. You may have noticed a slightly different backdrop on this video. We're having a blizzard outside, so I turned the camera to the other side of my office so you can see the hullabaloo going on out there. I've also got a clip of a sparrow that took refuge in a lamp housing out there. Very sad. And a woodpecker that put up with some high winds to gobble down some suet. Poor things, it's miserable out there. Okay, talk to y'all later. Things are blowing all over the place. I actually saw a squirrel fly this morning. It was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's fine. It got into a tree. 
Anyway, so it's almost Christmas. We've got almost no snow on the ground. Or at least we got our blizzard. And it's really cold out here too. Ooh. 